sliding unless anyone has an announcement they need to a burning announcement that they need to make go ahead Val yes if you did not get an email from me about this coming Friday's bingo and uh, requesting cards I'll put my email in the chat and um, the cards expire the links expire by Wednesday so uh, it's a timely thing I wanted to make sure that you, if you want to join us that you get in touch with me thanks Thank you, Val, for keeping the bingo going. It's important to have joy and laughter in all of this, isn't it? All right, loves, you can unmute yourselves now. I'll say the words just in case you don't have them in front of you. With this flame, we renew our commitment to justice, peace, and compassion. And please join Gary in saying these together. With this flame, we renew our commitment to justice, justice, peace, peace and, and compassion. And now we'll sing together, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll sing together the affirmation found in your order of service. We can stay unmuted for this and enjoy the uh, cacophony of singing on Zoom. we're getting better <laughs> that's good to know care it is the time in our service where we greet one another but before before we do we ask if you are new today or returning after a long hiatus if you could tell us or remind us of your name we'd love to greet you in open-hearted uu style invitation only of course if there's anyone who's new with go ahead lucille i'm back and very happy about it i'm home on nantucket I'm getting my vaccination oh. on Tuesday. I'll, I'll, I'll I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm happy I'm home. Oh. <laughs> Got my car inspected. Awesome. I'm legal. I always feel better when people return to the island. I don't know why. It's like you've been all out of the nest or something. I can't bear it. <laughs> and Linda and Gary, I went, walk. my first walk was at um, Quay's Pasture, that oh. beautiful. I love that walk. I love that walk. I love that walk. So thank you, Lucille. And then if there's anyone else, just go ahead and pop in. It's it's not always easy to find you here. Even though you uh, appear to be closest to me, you're actually spread all over. Why don't you unmute yourselves now and just say hello? Hi. Hi, Holly Hi everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello. 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 Good morning. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, 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 is he feeling? Is he better? He's better. Good. Where's Sarah? Where's Sarah? Where's Sarah? Where's Sarah? Where's Where's Loretta? 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 Where's Okay, I don't see it. So she has a We're just checking in and making sure the partners are around somewhere. We're worried. <laughs> <laughs> These are close times. You just never know what <laughs> right, where are you? I love. I'm gonna meet you all and we're off to where are we are. <laughs> so it's time for our first hymn this morning. But before we get started with the hymns, I have one brief announcement. Uh Next week, we have a special special musical service for um, our previous music director, Barbara Elder. And so the choir has been hard at work this week and next week recording some extra music. So the choir has this week off and uh, myself and some special guests will be doing a mixture of live 
and pre-recorded hymns. So this first hymn is number 1072, Evening Breeze, and it's very short, and it's around, and uh, I have some accompaniment that I will record live on my loop station, and um, you can sing along. It's repetitive. You'll pick it up uh, pretty quickly. So here we go, and I encourage you to remember as we're singing along, um, we're connect connected through the rhythm and through our breath. Even though we can't hear each other, um, you can still try to feel making music together at the same time. So, Evening Breeze. a joyful opening heartedness, Nigel. Thank you Thank so you. much. And John, my friend, you are up, if you could unmute yourself. The poem that I'll read is an excerpt from The Hill We Climb by Amanda Gorman. And this is part of the poem that she read at President Biden's inauguration. The hill we climb. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace. And the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it, somehow we do it, somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried, that we'll forever be tied together, victorious, not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. But one thing is certain, if we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. The new dawn blooms as we free it, 
for there is always light if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Thank you so much, John. Beautifully read. Thank you, John, for bringing that back to our hearts and minds. Please join me now for a time of meditation and reflection. Earth that births us, webs that weave us, winds that carry us near and far from home, root us until we know that we are never alone. Grieving, loving, birthing, leaving this sacred place, always tethered one to the other, witnessed, kept, remembered, we can never be lost. Memory wound in the webs of mist and sun holds us down, a gravitational pull, home. We are always found again and through one another, known and not forgotten. Grant us the peace of this love, a love that changes everything, a love that has always changed everything. Amen. It is the time in our service now for joys and concerns. And now it's time for our middle hymn. And uh, as previously mentioned, we have soloists on the hymn, hymns this week. And this features our dear Cynthia Sabe singing number 1002, Comfort Me. Cynthia, you comforted me and you spoke for me. Oh, love. Now my heart is so open, I don't think I can speak myself. <laughs> Thank you for that act of deep love. Thank you, my friend. Beautiful.
Before I begin, I want to let you know that there'll be a talk about after this uh, sermon, after this service. Um, there's a, it's a strong and focused sermon on racism and caste, and I know that some of you are hurting, that you lost something or someone you love or feel alone and aching and lost. Please know that I see you. I feel your suffering. I know you are here. Just abide with us. And maybe there is something here that can be a medicine for you. Seeing it another and ourselves more clearly sometimes offers a way forward, a focus, a possibility that was not there before. I hope you find this here. I was asked by the Athenaeum to facilitate a conversation about caste written by Isabel Wilkerson. I agreed and spent many hours over vacation reading the book and taking notes and organizing my thoughts so that I might be well prepared. The hour and a half conversation hosted by the Athenaeum had over 78 people join it. It is so hard to say no to this work for me, and this work is so hard. I really want to turn away from it. I want to lay it down and just try to be the best person I can be here and now. And I know I cannot. I am called, we are all called, to peel these layers back and sit with our discomfort, our dis-ease, our helplessness in all the ways we tell ourselves that we have looked, watched, read, learned enough about the work of multiculturalism and anti-racism and that, that we need to do in order to do the next thing well. And then I re remember, right, this story of white supremacy is alive and well, and our last president did not create it. He used it, but he didn't create it. And when I feel like I can't just read another book on racism, I watch the video of people who stormed the Capitol, and I straighten my spine, and I open my heart, and I go deeper, one breath at a time. I remember doing this work when I was at Harvard Divinity School, as we are required to do in our preparation to become UU ministers. In one three-part workshop, our UU presenters of color told us, all white people are racist. Immediately, we white people went about describing our own pasts, parents who were immigrants, great struggles to get where we are now, privations. I look at that now and see that it was too hard to take in. We are good people who have worked hard, is what we were saying. Racism is the water we swim in. It is our bread and butter. It is the air we breathe. No one escapes it. The notion that all people, white people, are racist has been pushed back on by other UUs of color. Are we to carry this original sin, we who do not believe in original sin? And yet trying that on, carrying that around and then allowing it to be integrated into my consciousness, which took about five years, has not harmed me. It did not cower me and make me feel I could have no voice at that, or that my voice was always already tainted the minute I spoke. It opened my heart, saying, Linda, you are a racist, which still burns, allowed me to start at the beginning. It took my excuses out of my mouth. It forced me to show up. In the conversation this past Tuesday, I was asked to do an introduction of myself, and in it I spoke of my year living in India in a small village working in a school started by Gandhi. I spoke of living in Germany for two years and coming back to this country as a single mother who lived on welfare while getting my undergraduate degree in, uh, in economics and philosophy. I spoke of all the people I met in the welfare office room, and I spoke too of knowing that all the people of color in that room were treated differently than I was when I went in for my interview every month. I spoke of still airing all the time when it comes to knowing what to say and how to say it, and sometimes I say, stay silent because I'm afraid of saying the wrong thing or saying the right thing the wrong way. And I'll never forget when I lamented about this exhaustion, as I called it, to a friend, and she said so rightly, I understand your exhaustion and discomfort, Linda, and you can imagine the exhaustion and discomfort of people of color who that their exhaustion and discomfort that they live with every minute. 
about not saying the right thing the right way and being penalized at work or in groups of friends or in their leases. Touché. Thing is, we can no more lay this work down than we can lay down our lineage, our skin, our country, our language, our democracy. Here are some things I learned from CAST, and as I go through this list, you will have reactions to it as I did, and I want you to know up front that I'm not suggesting that we are all white supremacists. I am suggesting that white supremacy has a long history in which we are implicated. We will have a talk about after the service, so write down any thoughts, questions, reactions you have, and let's share at the under, end of the service, not to talk about how we are better than other white people, but to open our hearts and ask deeper questions of one another. Here are some of the points made by CAST, by Isabel Wilkerson, that, oh, that I cannot ever forget. Slavery preceded democracy. Democracy and the ranking of human beings into caste based on skill, skin color have always gone hand in hand. The Nazis used the American playbook of slavery to build their own laws concerning Jews. The part that they were most fascinated and perplexed by was this. How can a system of such brutality go on and the people who impose it or know that it is there still feel like they are good and innocent. After the Civil War, there was a period of reconstruction when the North pulled up, and then after that, the North pulled after the South, and they, cons they compensated the plantation owners, some of the richest people in the world, for their loss of income. Former slaves, the tortured, were never compensated. In Germany, there are monuments to the victims of the Nazi regime, regime. There are stones laid in the street with the names of the people murdered, and they call these stumbling stones. To get close enough to read the names, you have to bow. In America, there are statues of people who were slaveholders, one of the most brutal regimes of torture that the world has ever known. There are streets named after these folks and schools and universities. There are no monuments to the millions of African Americans who were murdered, though Brian Stevenson writes Just Mercy, a beautiful man and activist, and he just made a lynching memorial. Um, so it is the first. Slavery was not a long time ago. Its iterations live on. Though black bodies are not chained and forced to work hours that inhumane, are inhumane, even the Nazis felt that the American Southern Plantation 14-hour workday was too much, and they lessened theirs in their concentration camps. Now voter suppression, police brutality, white flight that leaves blacks living next to factories, hi hi highways, and far from the museums, restaurants, theaters, and beaches. I read of a, a beach in New York um, that they built an, an overpass too low for buses to go under because most of the people of color were bus, um, bus riders. Lack of health care options, lack of advancement opportunities, the list goes on. Until they were brought to the United States, those who were taken into slavery did not see themselves or call themselves black. They were Igbo or Yoruba. They were a people from a place. Until they came to this country, Germans, Irish, Polish people did not see themselves as white. They were a people from a place. It's an innovation that is only several hundred years old and started with the slave trade, naming skin color as a way to assign rank in a caste system. Those who were assigned to the category, those who are assigned to the category white also changes. Germans became white in 1840s. Irish became white in the 1850s to 1880s. Jews, Hungarians, Poles, each became white with time and approval. When did you become white? Or said another way, when did you learn that others were not white? We'll start with that question in our breakout room. 
Just a few more, my dears. The, lower ca the lowest caste is occupied by black bodies. Lower caste whites are educated to believe that the only way to retain their white skin privilege is not to join with black people in fighting for the things that plague them both. Low wages, substandard housing, lack of health care and opportunity for advancement. Rather, lower class white people are told that it is the black folk who are responsible for their plight. One can lose everything but not whiteness. Religion and science play a role here too. Slavery was justified using the Hebrew and Christian Bible passages about masters who must be obeyed and slaves who were less than, about God wanting and blessing this hierarchy. Eugenics was used as a scientific methodology to prove that black people were less intelligent, indeed, that they should be grateful for slavery as it took them from jungles and gave them purpose. Lastly, have you ever seen a black depiction of God when God is de depicted? They are existed, but one must seek them. You're probably feeling it now. Please stop enough. I need to feel like a good enough person to go on with my day. Here is why I listed all of these points, which are well documented and referenced in Wilkerson's book, which I recommend to you. The caste system built in our country on skin color dehumanizes us all. The only way to live in a system where so many are disadvantaged and must, much worse is to hold it at bay, is to not integrate it, to keep, is to keep it from our conscience. We have to keep telling ourselves that something we know to be true is not happening. The only way to live with it is to deny it. And in this denying, we are all left dehumanized, disconnected from humanity, lost to our souls. As when we deny anything that is visceral and right before us, in psychology, we, right, we all say to, you can't change it if you don't see it. When we cannot connect to our whole humanity, then we are not well, not whole, not fully in our bodies and our lives. Everyone must be liberated. Everyone must be allowed their humanity for any of us to fully occupy our own. What George Floyd's murder opened up was the opportunity to recognize the level of desensitation, desensitation we have become used to. Derek Chauvin is the police officer whose knee was on Floyd's neck. We need to talk about him as, not, as much as Floyd. He is the symbol of the level of disconnection that we are all grappling with. When you feel lost, drowning, confused, then you are beginning to touch the core of your own humanity. The dissonance is beginning to release its hold. Awakening first means telling the truth to ourselves. Saying that we believe all people are, are one and have inherent worth and dignity is not enough. How can we learn a oneness that honors the identity that color demands in our society? How can we learn a oneness that does not pretend colorblindness, which strips another's experience from them and therefore disallows true empathy? How can we learn to stand fully in our history and have the courage and the joy to change it? In our uh, talk about caste this week, one of the folks who spoke said that it was time to step up as white people and educate other white people so they can do better. I responded that though I agreed that we must all call one another and ourselves out with compassion, calling our own souls and others to live more fully into humanness and connection, we need to save our own souls first. There is no hierarchy of here. There is only this de dehumanization of this system. And the only way to do this salvation is to admit the fear, the shame, the loneliness, and confusion of it all. That, that is where we must begin, right here at the beginning. And maybe from there, as other white people see our hearts opening and our words changing and our questions deepening, they, will, they too will be encouraged to join this painful, and life-giving journey. This work undone 
is in the way of our potential. Like so many things that are in our way, we need to look at the individual and collective trauma and how it impacts our lives. Why do you want to do this work as a human being, as a leader, as a soul? Why is it important? Why might you push the envelope on this a bit? All of these answers involve saving ourselves from the soul conscious deadening work of closing our eyes to a system that destroys us and which therefore destroys each of us. I hope this conversation will continue at our talk about after the service today. Here's how I close my introduction during the CAST conversation at the Athenaeum. I am at the beginning of this journey with all of you. I am not an expert. I make mistakes every day. As we begin our conversation, I said, if we can enter with vulnerability and openness, not with answers or solutions, we are so uncomfortable beginning a conversation unless we know where it will end. But allowing that vulnerability and openness to be between us, then perhaps this very day, we might move the dial of our own awakening, our own awakening. And moving the dial toward our own awakening is not just about learning the water we swim in and telling the truth about our privilege. It's about opening, staying present in the pain, feeling the shame and not running. And of all these skills, whether we are learning how to walk or as one people or facing our, our past or suffering over loss, of waking up with less, fill, suffering over losses, like waking up with less physical capacity than we knew the day before, or suddenly knowing someone we adore is in pain and we can't fix it. If we look at all of this, all of this, that we say, well, that doesn't involve this conversation, but doesn't it? Because if we plant our feet on the ground of our existence, we can show up anywhere with insight, wisdom, understanding, and humility. May it be so, dear friends. May it be so. Amen. Please join me now for a moment of silence. It's interesting as these words flow over me, even though I wrote so many of them, I find myself saying, oh, but not that. That isn't about me. That's not my work. It's fascinating to hang out with all the ways that resistance and fear keep us from being present. And it's now time for the call to offering. I was talking to Nigel recently about the call to offering, and he reminded me something that really struck me. He said, Linda, everything is energy given and energy received, right? And he said, I wonder, what do you, all of you, receive in this service? And what energy are you willing to give in exchange for that? And of course, energy means so many things, baking brownies for the, <laughs> for the, um, for, uh, the Tuesday lunches, showing up in the million ways for each other that you already do in s every day. And it also means being willing to be generous with our resources. And I invite you to that at this time. Elizabeth? Yes, so um, I'll put in the chat after this uh, the link uh, to the website as well as the PO box. And if you do a check uh, to the that gets mailed to the church, just make sure that um, you put where you would like the donation to go, whether it's your uh, general pledge or uh, gift um, or your Sunday offering, just make sure to select where you're uh, designating it to go to. And when you go to UnitarianChurchNantucket.org, whoops, I've got too many things on my screen today. Um, you have at the top right the contribute and the text to give button. Um, if you have any questions about Tithely, just make sure to scroll down and 
where you see the leaping frog, you will see more information about how to um, give your pledge as well as a step-by-step -step guide and a video walkthrough um, if you need any, um, if you need that assistance. Um, and if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, there is the PayPal option. Just make sure to write in um, where you would like the money to go to. Um, and if you have not given your pledge yet for 2021, please make sure to send that in um, so that we know what that is. When you click on Tithely up at the top right, um, you've got your different selections, Sunday offering, pledge 2021, gift. Um, if you're doing um, any of those, you can do it as a recurring gift. Um, if you need to change anything, just um, make sure to click login and you can edit and uh, make sure to scroll down and click cover fees um, before you submit. With that, thank you. And I will go to Nigel. And today's offertory is um, brought to us by our own Liam Strand. Um, speaking of energy put in and gifts received, Music is one of the things that we can um, take so much time and effort to master, and we get we all get so much out of it. So thank you, Liam, for um, putting your time into this. And he and I got together at the church last week and recorded uh, Sonatina in A minor by Giri Antonin Benda on the Goodrich organ. So. Enjoy this. Thank you, Liam. And our final hymn for today is number 126. And we have, again, our own Elliot Levine coming to you live from California. And I encourage you all to sing along in your own space. Come thou fount of every blessing, Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise. While the hope of life's perfection Fills our heart with joy and love, Teach us ever to be faithful May we still thy goodness prove. Come, thou fount of every vision, lift our eyes to what may come. See the lion and the young lamb dwell together in thy home. Hear the cry 
years of war fall silent, feel our love glow like the sun, when we all serve one another, then our heaven is begun. Come thou fount of inspiration, turn our lives to higher ways, lift our gloom and desperation, show the promise of this day, help us bind ourselves in union, help our hands turn up their love, with thy aid, O fount of justice, earth be fair as heaven above. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liam. What a joy to see you there. I just loved watching your hands move along too. And Elliot, that beautiful voice of yours, my goodness, straight from heaven itself. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you so much. Bless you, my dears. May you know your inherent worth and dignity and may you use it to widen the container of inherent worth and dignity so that more people every day find their place within that love and that embrace. Amen. And please now join dear Gary in extinguishing the chalice. I'll remind you of the words, carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. And please yeah. unmute yourselves. Carry the flame. Of flame. peace and peace love, 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 love until we meet again. Meet again. Okay. again. And the postlude today is uh, a lovely little tune by a modern piano pedagogue named Melody Bober, and the title of it is Winter Memories. Oh, oh sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, everyone who participated so beautifully today. It takes a village. I'm grateful you are all part of this one. Before we go into our breakout rooms today, if anyone would like to um, 